Hello, 7th grade, we're back, and welcome to History with Mr. E. Today we're going over 21.3 and 21.4. 21.3 is art in the modern age. Last time we talked all about what makes something a classic, what makes something a popular uh, work, and we talked about music in the modern age. Today we're going to talk about art. Art in the modern age began in the 16th century, that's the 1500s, with a Christian artist named Albrecht Dürer. A-L-B-R-E-C-H-T, Albrecht Dürer. D-U-R-E-R. He did something called woodcutting, where he would draw a piece and then etch that piece into wood in something called relief, so that it stood up off the wood, and then they would roll ink over that and press a page into it, just like a printing press. His woodcut prints were widely available to all. He also did painting, but his most popular woodcut for Albrecht Dürer was the hands of an apostle, and they were praying hands, and I think there's a picture of it in your book, but I'm not sure. Hans Holbein the Younger um, was also a major artist of the early um, modern age, and he was the painter at the court of Henry VIII. And that's how a lot of artists made their money, was being hired by nobles to, to stay and do art for them, or by kings like Henry VIII. One of the most popular painters in the Dutch um, era was Rembrandt van Rijn. R-E-M-B-R-A-N-D-T V-A-N-R-I-J-N Now everybody knows him as Rembrandt and he drew pictures of everyday life and he painted big giant pictures and he painted beautiful pictures. You should look him up on Google too. All these names you should look up on Google to see their, to see their work. He drew realistic biblical scenes during the 17th century. Um, it would really benefit you guys to see this beautiful stuff that these guys painted instead of just listening to me talk about it. So make sure after after the video that, that you guys go through using your computer or your iPad and look up some of these works and, and, and pick which ones you really like. Rembrandt Van Rijn, Albrecht Dürer, and next is Jan Vermeer, 1632 to 1675, J-A-N-V-E-R-M-E-E-R. He drew landscapes and interiors of Dutch homes, regular pictures of regular people doing regular things. Um, Rembrandt and, Van and Vermeer were both Dutch. William Hogarth was a master of satirical painting, as was Hieronymus Both, Bosch. Hogarth is H-O-G-A-R-T-H, -H, Hogarth, and Bosch is B-O-S-C-H. They were masters of satirical painting, popular engravings, and they were the first to copyright paintings. If you see a work by Hieronymus Bosch, you don't forget it. He drew pictures of heaven, and he also drew very interesting pictures of Apocalypse and of, of his interpretation of hell. Bosch, B-O-S-C-H. Uh, he drew something called triptychs, which were basically three paintings that went together. Uh, that would definitely be a cool one, or an interesting one, I guess. I don't know if it's cool or not, but an interesting one to look up on Google. Jean-Baptiste Simeon Chardin. Uh, drew simple, natural beauty um, and common scenes. And then we went from the classic era into something called neoclassicism, or the new classic era. In the 1800s or the 19th century, there was Jacques-Louis David. Uh, and he drew a picture called the Oath of the Tennis Court. Who remembers us talking about the Tennis Court Oath, where the the National Assembly was formed. Or was it National Convention? National Assembly? National? I don't remember which one it was. But that's where the start of the French Revolution came about. He drew a picture or a painting of it. 
and that might actually be in your book in one or two different places, possibly in the section about the French Revolution, possibly in this section. Um, the neoclassicists drew clear, balanced paintings and used simple forms and bright colors. So they were beautiful pictures of, of you know, real life stuff that happened. The ones that I kind of like the best when it comes to painting are, well, there's two. The Romanticism, or Romantic paintings, and Impressionist paintings. Eugene Delacroix, and I'm not even going to spell it because I don't need you guys to look it up, uh, was a Romantic painter. He depicted great people of his day as romantic heroes in dramatic and emotional paintings. He drew with or er, painted with passion and imagination, and it sparked passion and imagination in people when they saw those. His was a reaction against that balance, that clarity, and that order of the neoclassicists. And then there was a realist, a realist painter named Gustave Courbet. C-O-U-R-B-E-T. He painted in the 19th century also, and he wanted to paint things around you as they really were. Almost like taking photographs. Um, you know, his classical art deals with universal and typical things. Things that everybody knows and everybody could see. Now when you see it, it shows little shots of history as things were, because a lot of times back then we never got to see things like that because we don't have pictures of things like that. So paintings like that were probably a little over dramatic, but it showed what people's lives were really like in that era. Then there's the Impressionists, and those may those were painters that made some beautiful, beautiful paintings. I love Impressionist art. Um, Renoir, R E N O I R, Renoir, Monet. M-O-N-E-T. And the most popular, probably, is Vincent Van Gogh. V-A-N-G-O-G-H. You should look up paintings by all of those guys. Impressionist. I-M-P-R-E-S-S-I-O-N-I-S-T. And they attempted, through their art, to show the ever-changing reality of a particular moment. That is, is art that looks almost slightly blurry that you can look at over and over and see different things every time you look at it. It emphasizes tiny details and gives the effect of changing light, of light moving and changing in the pictures. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff, Impressionist art. Make sure you look that up on Google after our lecture. Today we're also going to talk about classical literature. What was the first book printed, Chapito? You're correct. That was the Bible printed by Johann Gutenberg. It was the only source of truth that didn't wasn't full of error. That's the way the Bible is. Not just the Gutenberg Bible, but the Bible in general. The Word of God is the only source of truth undamaged by error, unmixed with error. But there are other classical examples of literature. William Shakespeare uh, is the greatest writer the world has ever known. Think of his works that you've probably heard of. Macbeth, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Taming of the Shrew, and about a thousand, well, not really, several dozen other very, very famous plays. He also wrote sonnets, that specific type of poetry. He understood human nature. He just understood how the man, how man's mind worked. Sometimes it was pretty dark. Sometimes it was full of love. Sometimes hate. Sometimes vengeance. But he just understood how man talked, thought, and felt. He showed the feelings of thoughts in men in general, and it was it turned out to be some beautiful work. There's an author named John Milton, which you may have heard of going to a Christian school being raised in church. John Milton was a champion for freedom of the press to help people write and publish their writings. Um, and he was also a champion of liberty in church and state. Rather than letting the Catholic Church dominate, he wanted to, to help people find um, truth 
um, you know, from writings. He wrote um, what our book calls the greatest poem in the English language, Paradise Lost, all about um, heaven and hell. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, you'll get a chance to read that in 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 uh, uh, an excerpt or an abridgment of it in your English class later on this year. Well, later on in 2021, and it's probably Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory, uh, probably the most popular and beloved allegory in the hi in history. An allegory is a story that's telling one story but trying to use that story as examples to help you understand other things. There was Jean de la Fontaine, F-O-N-T-A-I-N-E, who wrote Animal Fables. And I have a book of Fontaine's fables in my basement uh, that if anybody wants to read them, I can find them. Uh, Miguel de Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, C-E-R-V-A-N-T-E-S, Cervantes. Uh, a Spanish writer who wrote about Don Quixote, who was um, a man who had gone crazy and thought he was a knight saving a princess from a dragon, but the princess was a barmaid, and he wasn't a knight, and the dragon was a windmill, and he charged that windmill with his lance. Um, and of course, he'd never be able to knock it down, but that's where the term tilting at windmills comes from. It means trying to do something that's impossible, but still working hard at that task. Uh, Matsuo Bosho is the master of haiku. What's haiku? That's a three-line Japanese style of a poem. And the first line has five syllables. You guys know what syllables are, I hope. The second line has seven syllables. And the third line, again, has five syllables. And a lot of times they capture just a single moment in time or nature. So maybe today, if you guys remember, try to read some haiku and maybe write one of your own. Think of something in nature that you could write about and write a 575 uh, poem. Three lines. It take you five minutes. In the 18th century, that's the 1700s, um, religion declined a little bit in literature. Uh, books became tainted with deism. That's the clockmaker theory. Humanism, that's the man is God theory. And atheism, there is no God, the theory. Alexander Pope wrote sat satiric poetry, poetry that basically was mocking something or calling something out on its flaws, and he was a deist. Uh, Johann Schiller uh, wrote William Tell. Daniel Defoe was a Christian. He wrote a, It was a great novel that he wrote, Robinson Crusoe. It's very dense. It would take you a long time to read it, but it was an interesting story about a man who shipwrecked for many, many years on an island, and it takes goes into great detail about how he built a, a life for himself on that island. How he built um, a place for himself to live inside of a cave or up a tree, and how he hunted, how he planted crops, how he he uh, made clothes for himself, and even how he met people that were exploring the island and was and was made a friend and was. Uh, was eventually rescued. In the 19th century, just like art and music, romantic literature came about. That's romantic literature is literature characterized by a concern for beauty and power of nature. By emotion, by seeing that beauty and power in nature and feeling those feels. They wanted the reader to feel. There were romantic poets like William Wordsworth, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote one of my all-time favorite poems, The Charge of the Light Brigade, uh, which you guys have listened to in class, I think. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He wrote The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. 
And then there are American authors during this era. You'll read about, you'll read uh, stories from these authors in, in other years in your history or in your class. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter. You heard us discussing The Scarlet Letter for days and days. Um, in 11th and 12th grade English class while you guys were in study hall. Herman Melville wrote Moby Dick. Um, there were British authors. Those two were American. This is British. Charles Dickens wrote Oliver Twist, Great Expectations, and one of a, a story you probably all know, The Christmas Carol, about Mr. Scrooge and the Three Ghosts and Marley and Cratchit and all those guys. Um, and then there was uh, an author from Denmark named Hans Christian Andersen who wrote fairy tales. He collected those tales from other literature or other other people who told them and wrote them down and collected them and told them as great stories for kids to read. There was Selma Lagerlof, L-A-G-E-R-L-O-F, the first female writer to win the Nobel Prize, which is the world's greatest prize for literature, and she wrote children's stories. Russian authors like Dostoevsky wrote Crime and Punishment, and Leo Tolstoy wrote War and Peace. These are massive, epic books about the nature of man, and some of it was pretty dark. So look up some of these works that I've talked about. Uh, discuss with Mrs. with Mrs. Humphrey today. Um, what's your favorite piece of art from the modern age is, and what uh, what books you think now uh, might be coming or, or might be classics books that you've read. I'll bet Chipito or Lorenzo could fill you in because they read a ton of books. And I know that, that all of you guys have read books in your, in your English classes, and you're going to read a lot of books next semester, too, in your 7th grade English class. So get ready to talk about classical books, classical paintings, classical music, classical stuff, other stuff, architecture, I guess. I don't know. We're not going to talk about architecture. But anyhow, thank you for listening. I miss you guys. Stay safe. Stay calm. Thank you for listening to History with Mr. E.